A lot of fun aspects to this cedar chest build, including these two inch wide box joints, the double waterfall curve top. There's a tree inside with some fun joinery. The lid stays open wherever you leave it. I'll show you how I built it. Let's dive in. Figuring out the layout of the panels is like solving a puzzle, and it's definitely more art than science. I'm trying to minimize the amount of white sapwood while allowing some strategically placed accents here and there, and also just trying to make the joints flow as best as possible by matching color and grain and joining heartwood to heartwood and sapwood to sapwood. There's a bit of a repetitive workflow here between the miter saw, the joiner, and the table saw as I cut down the lumber to rough length, clean up one edge on the joiner, and make the other edge parallel on the table saw. And then I carefully inspect and fit the joint between each board and another pass through the joiner here and there is needed until all of the panels are laid out and ready for glue up. These are pretty routine glue ups, no dowels, dominoes, or biscuits needed, just an even distribution of clamping pressure and I like using some battens to help keep the panels as flat as possible. And I leave them in the clamps overnight. To flatten the panels after glue up, I start with a hand plane and some elbow grease. I'm able to knock down any high spots pretty quickly and use a straight edge along the way to check my work. Then I move on to using a sander with 120 grit sandpaper to get my clumsy plane marks out and just to dial in the flatness, continuing to check with a straight edge as I go. Okay, now with all four side panels flattened on both sides and sanded with 120 grit, then I'm ready to cut them to final size. I cut them all to final width using the same table saw setting and cut them all at the same time. This will be the height of the chest. And by using a cross cut sled, then I cut all four panels to their final length. For the shorter end panels, I'm able to use a stop block on my cross cut sled just to make sure they're exactly the same length. And for the front and back, I just meticulously measure to make sure I get them both exactly the same length. And after arranging the panels the way I want them in the final assembly, I label each corner and I also mark which way is up just so I know which edge of each panel to start with when cutting the box joints. So I made this little jig from some plywood that I'll use with the router to cut the box joints. It's basically a top plate with a vertical support fixed at a 90 degree angle. There are two guide rails for the edge of the router base plate to write against and it's important that these are square to the jig and the guide rails are spaced at a width apart that will give a two inch wide box joint cut given the size of my router's base plate and using a half inch router bit. And the stop block is positioned at two inches. It's the same distance from the cut opening as the cut is wide. The precision of the stop block placement determines how tight or loose the joint will be and therefore the blue painter's tape is just my way of dialing in the right fit as I tested out the jig. Okay, so let's go give this thing a try. I clamped the jig onto one edge of the longer panels, the back panel, just making sure that the stop block of the jig is firmly up against the edge of the workpiece. And this extra piece of wood should give some protection from chipping out of the edges of the cut. And using a half inch straight router bit, I make the first cut. And then it's just a matter of moving down the edge of the workpiece one cut at a time. Awesome, one edge is done, seven more to go. And if you're wondering why I wear these ridiculous looking coveralls. Next I'm gonna do an adjoining edge, one of the shorter end pieces. To start this piece, I use a spacer block from one of my test cuts when I was making the jig. The spacer block positions it so that the first cut will be offset from the adjoining piece. After making this cut, you can see the notch on this one is positioned right at the edge of the board. And then it's just a matter of working down the edge one notch at a time. Now just to do a test fit, 
The joints are a perfect friction fit, but not too tight, and I'm a happy camper. So I went on to cut the rest of the panels off camera, a total of 32 cuts, and on one of them I got this chip out in this area with some unusual grain direction. I might have to remake this panel, but I'm going to try fixing it first. By taking a scrap piece with some similar grain pattern, I kind of just whittle away until I get a piece that I can glue on. I'm using some epoxy and I mix in some sawdust just to try to match the natural color of the wood. And after it's dry, I sand the surface and then go back to the jig and the router to true up the joint. I actually think this looks pretty good, so I decide to stick with this panel and not make a new one. So I'm going to use 3 quarter inch cedar plywood for the bottom panel. I probably would have been fine just using a panel of solid cedar. Would have been a lot less expensive for sure. But I guess I feel like having the stability of the plywood on the bottom panel will be good to avoid any wood expansion or contraction problems over time. So after cutting the panel to size on the table saw, then I use a router to cut a notch for the concealed dado joint. Then I set up a dado stack on my table saw at 3 8 inch thickness and set the fence so that the outside of the dado stack is the width of the plywood bottom or 3 quarters of an inch. On the long panels, the front and back of the chest, I can cut the dado all the way through because it will be hidden within the box joint. But for the shorter end panels, I need to start and finish the dado cut without cutting through the ends. Some pencil marks on my fence help me know where to start and end the cut. Then I use a chisel to square up the ends of the dados where the round saw blade didn't reach. Before assembling the chest, I do some final sanding on all of the inside surfaces to 220 grit just because it's much easier now than after it's assembled. And some blue painter's tape will help with the glue cleanup on the inside corners. I'm using Type Bond 3 which will give me a little bit slower set time and give me time to get everything together and in clamps. This video clip that I've accelerated here was 15 minutes long in real time and I'd like to believe that I had it all in clamps within 10 minutes of starting to apply the glue. I have one clamp for each of the 2 inch box joints and really not a lot of clamping pressure on each clamp, just kind of snug. And finally I just check for squareness and then I take the blue tape off before the glue dries. Here's just a quick closer look at how the clamps are set with the box joints and seeing that there's pretty good glue squeeze out in every joint. A quick sanding reveals some really nice looking box joints. Strangely rewarding to blow the dust off. Now it's time to move on to the top of the chest. The layout of the boards for the top is about 3 inches wider than the final width, which gives me the ability to rip the edge piece on each side before glue up. With this piece turned under and glued on, as you'll see coming up in the video, it will give some continuity to the grain pattern on the waterfall top edges. Then same as the other panels, there's the glue up, flatten with the plane, and sanding of the top lid of the chest. So I take the pieces from the lid that I cut off before the glue up and put a 45 degree bevel on them on the table saw. And then cut some additional pieces the same length and width so that the thickness of the lid will be three boards thick or two and a quarter inches thick. Since I've pre-sanded all of the inside surfaces before doing this glue up, so I want to use some blue tape to prevent a glue mess on all of the inside corners. So with some glue and a lot of clamps, I've created the structure for the waterfall curve on both the front and back edges of the lid. 
Using a crosscut sled on my table saw, I'm able to cut the top to final length, and then I just do a quick test fit on the chest before gluing on the lid's end panels. You've probably figured out my obsession with blue tape on inside glue corners by now. Some brad nails help hold it all in place while I get some clamps on it. And when the glue is dry the next day, I use a flush trim bit on the router to clean up the edges. The rounded edges, what I've been calling the waterfall edges, will be 3 inches in diameter. I start by marking off some pencil lines that will help guide me as I create the curve. And with some really bad camera work, I didn't quite capture marking a 45 degree bevel that will cut on the table saw. This cut on the table saw takes away the majority of the material that needs to be removed on each edge at the top. By creating all of these pencil marks, I've created some guides or boundaries that I'll follow as I take on sanding until I get the radius that I'm looking for. I do my best to leave those pencil lines right up until the last pass of the sander where I finally round it over. And then a final pass by hand with a stretch piece of sandpaper really dials in a perfect circular radius. And then I repeat the same process on the other edge. This goes a lot faster than you might think, only probably 20 minutes per side, and the results are an amazing straight and consistent radius down the whole length of the lid. I'm going to go ahead and fit the hinges before attaching the trim around the lid. In order for the lid to fit firmly flat, I need to cut some mortises for the hinges on the back panel. By just using some stop blocks and a straight router bit set to a depth of an eighth of an inch. These hinges are awesome. They have enough torsion strength to hold the weight of the lid open, even if it's only partially open and it prevents it from coming crashing down. With these hinges, you don't need a separate bracket or chain or hydraulic cylinder like you'd see on some chests that just have piano hinges. Yeah, for any chest like this, I highly recommend these hinges, and I'll leave a link in the description. Then moving on to attach the legs, I attach the leg blocks with some help of some alignment spacers so they're perfectly square and they're half inch offset from the edge. Then with some glue, some brad nails, and some clamps, the legs are secured to the blocks. I'm being careful to get the handles on the end panels level and centered, and they may need to hold quite a bit of weight, so I'm going to use some screws in addition to glue for some extra strength. Then I attach some 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch runners which will hold the small tray inside the chest. Moving on to the trim molding, I'm using an OG bit on the router table and I think that using feather boards not only makes it easier, but it's really necessary along with keeping a consistent feed rate for a clean and consistent cut for the full length. I'm just using my miter saw to cut the trim molding and I sneak up on the length. And then just glue the trim on and secure it with some brad nails. Before attaching the trim on the lid, I need to cut a small mortise on the router table to fit around the hinges. My idea with designing it this way is to kind of hide the hinges. Here's a quick shot of it finished. The hinges aren't completely hidden, but they don't look too awkward. To fill some voids in the knot holes, and also the brad nail holes, I found that using a mix of two colors of this wood filler, red oak and walnut, best matches the color of this cedar. Okay, one last thing to build before finishing up is the tray that goes inside the chest. I realize this video is getting long, so I'll go through this quickly. Using a planer, I reduce the sideboards down to half inch thickness. Then using a half inch dado stack on my table saw, I use my box cutting jig to cut each notch one by one. And then I cut a slot for the half inch cedar plywood bottom panel. Really similar in design and construction to the chest itself, just smaller in scale. After glue up and some sanding on the joints, then I've got this really handy tray to hold smaller items in the chest.
I really like this Deft brand lacquer that I'm going to spray on as a finish. This is definitely one of the most rewarding steps of the project, to see the wood color and grain come to life. So after three coats of lacquer, then I go over it all with very fine steel wool. You could also use a really fine sandpaper, but I think the steel wool works just as good and is much easier. And then just one final coat of lacquer. And now with the lacquer dryer, I'm just putting the lid on to finish up the project. Thank you so much for watching, and if you think I've earned it, it'd be great if you hit that thumbs up like button and consider subscribing.